In the sport of cycling, aerodynamics are paramount. For a cyclist pedaling on flat terrain at a speed of 30 kilometers an hour, as much as 90% of the resistive force experienced comes from aerodynamic drag. That's why in races like the Tour de France, cyclists often ride in a line or a bunch called a peloton. This lets the leading rider bear the burden of slicing through the wind while following riders expend less effort. Today we're going to take a closer look at aerodynamic drag in cycling and what factors affect it. And the first tool we'll use is some Flowviz. For this, I got some help from the folks at the University of Colorado at Boulder. With Professor Gene Hertzberg, we set up fog machines and a high-speed camera to look at what happens as Brett from the CU cycling team rode by. Here's an example with Brett in a typical riding position with his hands on top of the handlebars. As you can see, his passage leaves a hole in the fog behind him. And here's how it looks in slow motion. Brett's passage really stirs things up in the fog. In some places, you can see it spinning. In others, you can see layers of fog moving in different directions. For contrast, here's a more race-like position with Brett's hands in the drops on the lower part of the handlebars. Crouched forward like this, our cyclist cuts a smaller hole through the fog, and we don't see as much motion in the wake behind him. To really get at what's happening here, we'll use another tool, computational fluid dynamics or CFD. But first, let's look at how we calculate drag. This is the typical formula for aerodynamic drag, and it depends on several factors. The first is air density, represented by the Greek letter rho. The density of air decreases with altitude, so one way to experience less drag is to move from sea level to the mountains. The second factor is v, the cyclist's velocity relative to the air around them. Notice that velocity is squared. That means that a cyclist going twice as fast actually experiences four times the drag. The third factor, a, is the projected frontal area of the cyclist and bike. In general, the smaller the frontal area, the lower the drag. That means one way to reduce drag is to make yourself as small as possible on the bike. The final component of our equation is the coefficient of drag. Unfortunately, this number is one we can't simply calculate or look up. Even for a simple shape like a sphere, the coefficient of drag depends on factors like speed and surface roughness, so we have to measure it directly. With engineers from SimScale, we simulated flow around a cyclist in three different on-the-bike positions. The first is an upright position with hands on top of the handlebars. Here, most of the cyclist's torso is presented to the wind, so we don't expect this to be an aerodynamically advantageous position. The second position puts the rider's hands lower on the handlebars, in what cyclists call the drops. This leans the rider farther forward and gives them excellent control on the bike. It's a typical racing position both on flat terrain and when descending. The last position has our rider crouched on the bike's top tube. The rider is even lower now, but it's extremely tough to pedal from this position, so it's only really used when coasting downhill. The three positions vary a lot in frontal area. The drops and top two positions are 20% and 34% smaller than the upright position's area. But the simulations, all for a velocity of 50 km per hour at sea level, show the drag in the second and third positions are 14% and 32% lower, respectively. So getting smaller on the bike doesn't make the drag go down by an equal amount. To see why, let's look at how air flows around our cyclist. Here we see air velocity in a plane centered on the cyclist. We're only showing the velocity component in the plane of the cyclist's movement. Anywhere that's white is moving at the speed of the cyclist. Anything that's in color moves slower. Notice that there's a large region of slower velocity behind our upright cyclist, especially especially right behind the saddle. When a streamlined object moves through a flow, this wake area shows little to no slowdown, so having a large slow-moving region behind the cyclist indicates a lot of drag. By getting lower on the bike, our cyclist is able to shrink the extent of this slow-moving region, but can never get rid of it completely. Even on the top tube, the area immediately behind the cyclist's torso shows a big slowdown. We can also expand to look at three-dimensional structure behind the cyclist. Here we see snapshots of the velocity at different points in the cyclist's wake. We can start associating different parts of the flow with the areas on the cyclist. For example, we see the slower area associated with the cyclist's head here, and as we move away we see the effect of the cyclist fade. There's also a distinctive asymmetry to the cyclist's wake. This comes from how air flows around the cyclist's torso and legs, so it would change with leg position as the cyclist pedals. If we look at other positions, we see similarities in the shape of the wake, but distinctive differences in the strength. Here in the drops position, the helmet region fades more quickly, and we see a little less asymmetry behind the cyclist's body. With the cyclist crouched on her top tube, the region of slower air has really been compressed, and some of the asymmetries are much much less obvious. Overall, our cyclist and bike are more streamlined here. To get a sense of the rotation in the cyclist's wake, we can look at streamlines. Taking cuts through the wake shows the vortex structures coming off the cyclist's torso and hips and how they change as the cyclist gets lower. If we look from behind, you can really appreciate the difference in positions. Here the colors indicate velocity to the left or right of the cyclist's direction of travel. Getting lower makes a really big difference here, both by making the vortices smaller and by reducing the crossflow velocity. So next time you're out riding, remember that smaller is more aero, or better yet, find a buddy to draft off of.
This episode was sponsored by SimScale, who offer cloud-based engineering simulation capabilities right in your browser. All of the simulations you saw in this video were done with their software. SimScale's goal is to make engineering simulations like computational fluid dynamics, finite element analysis, and thermal simulation available to everyone. You can try all of this out yourself with a free community plan, as long as you don't mind your projects being publicly available. If you'd like to try simulating a cyclist, I recommend checking out SimScale's Sports Aerodynamics Workshop, which will show you everything you need to know to get started. When I was a student, software like this cost thousands of dollars to license and you needed a high-powered desktop or a supercomputer to run it. Now with SimScale, anyone can access this kind of software for free. I encourage you to check it out and if you do something neat with the cycling models, be sure to share it in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Pulling this one off took a lot of help, so I'd like to thank Ollie and Nettie for the simulations, Jim and Brett for being my volunteer cyclists, and Gene and James for staying up until 1 in the morning filming Flovis with me. Last but not least, thank you to my Patreon supporters who help make videos like this one possible. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe and check out some of my other videos. And and if you want to talk about aerodynamics in the Tour de France, you can find me in the comments below.